Greetings, everyone. This is Mr. Mullen. In this podcast, I'm doing a, a little pre-lab on our Newton Second Law lab that we're going to be doing in the next couple of days. So this law uses what's known as a modified Atwoods machine, which is a um, experimental device that we can use to, to measure the relationship between force, mass, and acceleration. And so this is a little drawing of our setup that we're going to be using in class. We're going to have a, a motion detector um, that we have attached to or uh, sitting on one end of the long motion track. And then we have a, um, a motion cart set up here, and th the motion cart is going to be pulled along this string by some uh, hanging mass setup that we have here. And as that mass hangs, um, as the Earth pulls on the hanging mass, it will pull and accelerate the entire the system, the cart attached and everything. Um, a standard Atwoods machine is just two masses over a pulley, this one here has um, a mass on over a pulley, but then the other side of the machine is uh, on a horizontal surface. Um, the difference here is that you've got the force of gravity pulling on both of these, where on my cart, I've got the force of gravity and the normal force are canceling out, so there's not a whole lot of vertical stuff going on for the modified Atwood machines. So you're going to be using this, um, this kind of setup, and you're going to be exploring how the um, the force on a system affects the acceleration. You're going to graphically determine that relationship. Um, and then you're also going to be looking how changing the mass of the system affects the acceleration while keeping um, the other variables constant. So your group members, uh, you're going to have to divide your labor force in order to do this lab. But before I do that, I want to just uh, do a little pre-lab talking about some of the important uh, ideas behind the lab. So first I'd like us to uh, watch this little video and this little video is just going to be a, um, a picture of the experimental setup and I'd like you to make some observations of what are some things that you could um, that you could make quantifiable or measurable. What are some observations? Um, so go ahead and watch this now. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a, a, a picture of what's happening when this uh, experimental setup is set up. So I have the motion track uh, and the motion cart on there. And I have a very thin string attached to the one end of the cart. And then on this end, we have a super pulley. And I'm going to attach a hanging mass directly to the string. And I'm going to release it from rest. And I'd like you to notice uh, about the motion of the cart. As I release this string from rest. All right. So. All right, so one of the first things that we should have noticed about the, the motion of the object is that the cart was uh, definitely accelerating from rest. And as it was doing so, um, it was going in a constant direction. Um, arc accelerated in a constant direction, um, and it started from rest. Okay, so um, my question for you is, okay, that we know that the cart was accelerating. Um, the, the question is, what factors are going to affect the acceleration of the system? Of the system. And when I say the system, if you noticed that the, the entire system was um, was accelerating at the same rate. I mean, everything was connected together. So the system was all the mass involved uh, connected to the string, all the, the different masses, one and two. Um, so what factors affect the acceleration of the system? This is what we want our dependent variable to be. We want to see how the acceleration is affected. So what are some factors that, that could affect those? So really quick, maybe pause this video and kind of think about um, Think about some different factors that might affect the acceleration of the system. All right, now that you've thought about that for a little bit, I'm just going to write down some ideas that you may have had, and then we'll cross them out or identify which ones are, are a good idea. Um, the first thing you probably could have noticed is that I added that little hanging mass on there. And you may have thought, well, if I change the mass of the hanger, um, the mass uh, on the mass hanger, that that should have some effect on how uh, how it accelerated. If you said that, I would completely agree. 
I'm going to put a little dash here, mass on the mass hanger, um, and we're going to come back to, uh, to that one in a second. Um, all right, so the other thing that you may have said, well, if we look at the back of that motion cart, um, there's actually a, a lot of places where we could add mass right to the back of it. There's kind of a little bucket seat in there. We can put mass on top of it. So you may have thought, well, if I change the mass of the overall system, I add more mass, then it's going to change the rate at which it accelerates. Um, can totally buy that. So we've got two different things that, that could be causing a change in the acceleration. Um, you may have said uh, the amount of friction or the surface type. And I would totally, uh, I totally agree that that would be something that might affect the acceleration. What we're going to do in this lab is we're actually going to um, ignore or minimize that amount of friction. Uh, we're going to incline the ramp slightly to try to minimize the effect of friction. Okay, so I actually incline the ramp slightly to minimize the uh, of the small amount of friction there might be. Um, you may have also said, well, there's that little string that he had attached to it. Um, maybe if I change the, um, the, the string specs or the type of string, um, type of string like the length or the, um, the different little specs of the string, um, or the string specs. And I would say that might that might actually have something to do. If I get a really thick string or one that's kind of um, really thick, it may not uh, go through that pulley as easily. So what I want us to do is I want us to assume, um, and this is an assumption that we're going to make in most problems, is we're going to assume that that string uh, is going to be massless. Okay, we're going to assume its mass is pretty negligible, and we're also going to assume that that pulley is going to be f basically frictionless. Okay, that's going to mean we can we can ignore any effect that the string or the the pulley might have on the acceleration. Um, and then you may have also said, well, maybe the length of the track uh, might affect the acceleration. And was the length of the track having anything to do with the cause of the acceleration? Um, was that going to change anything? And you should be saying, well, no, that's not going to do anything. Um, the length of the track had nothing to do with, with what was causing it to accelerate. So we're not going to look at the length of the track either. So really, we've, we've got these two things that we're going to investigate today. We're going to look at changing the mass on the hanger down here, and then we're going to look at changing the mass of the system. And before we go on any further, um, we're going to need to draw a little force diagram or free body diagram for our mass 1 and our mass 2 on our hanging mass and talk a little bit about the forces going on in this uh, diagram. So I'm going to look at mass 1 to start and I'm going to draw all the forces acting on mass 1. So you can just draw your little free body diagram right on the, the object. And I notice that the um, mass 1 is in our Earth's gravitational field. So there's a force of gravity on one, okay, on that mass one. Um, I also notice that there's a surface underneath of it supporting it. Atoms are scrunched together. I've got a normal force um, on our, our object one. And just kind of a little recap. Remember that the acceleration in the y direction for that mass on top, it was not accelerating vertically. So I know that my net force in that direction was zero which meant my forces were uh, balanced vertically. There was, there was vertical equilibrium there. It was not uh, accelerating up or down. So those are going to be balanced forces. And then when I look at other objects that are pushing or pulling mass 1, we're going to remember, we're going to ignore any frictional force, force of friction here, because we were going to assume that this is kind of like a frictionless situation. Um, we, we tried to slant the incline just a little bit so that any friction there might be might be accounted for. So it was kind of rolling down a mini hill to account for that friction. So we're not going to ignore that force. And then mass 1 was clearly accelerating, so there's got to be some unbalanced force. And of course there was that string attached. 
So this was our, our little tension force on the mass by the string. And I noticed that as the cart was moving, it was accelerating um, in the direction of the string and down the pulley. And then if I look at object two, mass two down here, um, what would mass two feel? Well, mass two would feel a force of gravity okay, on, on object two. Um, and then it also has a little string attached to it pulling up on mass two. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw a little force of tension on here. Okay, this is FT. And I did draw the force of gravity a little bit longer than the force of tension because mass two was accelerating down. Um, and so when I look at my problem here, and I'm looking at all these forces involved, I see that it was accelerating. Um, but in order for us to, uh, to deal with the acceleration of the system, remember we've got this little motion detector that's going to be measuring the motion of this thing. Um, when I look at all the forces acting, if that hanging mass were not there, this system would not be accelerating. So as soon as I put that hanging mass present, that force of gravity on that second mass is really what's causing this to, to accelerate. Um, and then when I say, well, wait a second, the force of tension is opposing the force of gravity on that object, and I totally would agree with you. However, when I look at both objects as a system, what will happen is that that force of tension pulling, um, pulling down on object one, remember if we assume that a, 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 a mass or a string is massless, then that's going to mean that um, that the, the force felt throughout the string is going to be identical. Just like when you stretch out a rubber band, the force on either end of the rubber band is going to be the same. The same thing's true with this force of tension in this massless string. So when this end of the string gets pulled by that mass, then the mass is going to feel the pull back, just like a rubber band, of an equal and opposite force in the other direction. Um, and so these two little forces here, this force of tension and this force of tension here, we're going to learn in class are actually going to be um, what is called a Newton's third law force pair. Newton's third law force pair. And so what this means is that we've got these equal and opposite forces. I pull on you, you pull on me, and you feel this force of tension, both of these objects. But when I include both objects within the system, what I can do is I can treat my objects because this pulley is just redirecting the force. I can pretend like, okay, on mass one, draw a little picture down here. Um, I can pretend like on uh, mass one, one second here. Okay, so mass one is feeling that force of tension along the horizontal direction. And then mass two is feeling a uh, force of tension it was equal and opposite in the opposite direction. Mass two was feeling the force of gravity. I'm just making the direction of the string like my, you know, just making it all one x-axis so I can just pretend they're all in a line. What's going to happen is because I'm accelerating to the right, if I include all these objects in the system, both of these forces here that are my newton third law force pairs, they're going to actually cancel, um, they're going to cancel each other out. They're pulling in opposite directions, and so I pull to the right, you pull to the left. Those are going to have a, a net effect, which means that the only force the object as a whole is going to feel is going to be um, just this force of gravity here. Those other two forces, internal forces within the system that are equal and opposite, are going to have a canceling effect. So those are my little uh, newton sur law force pairs. Um, so what this means then is that this force is going to actually be the net force for the whole system. For objects one and two, um, the net force on the whole system, that's the only external force on the whole system that's going to be, um, going to be accelerating it. Because those two internal forces, so the force of gravity on, on mass two um, is going to be equal to the net force on um, both objects, mass one and two. So when I look at this here, that force of gravity is my unbalanced net force, um, and I can actually calculate the force of gravity by using my formula for um, 
f f g. So that's just going to be equal to the um, the mass times. That's just going to be equal to. Give me one second here. Um, having some slight technical issues with my. Um, Uh, equal to the mass times the gravitational acceleration. Okay, so this is the net force for the whole system. Whole system. All right. So what is this going to look like for our experiment? Um, so how do we do this? So we've got our two different experiments that we're going to be doing today. We're going to be measuring how does changing the net force affect the acceleration. So in order to change the net force, remember. What we're looking at is we're looking at changing the mass on the hanger. Okay, we're looking at changing the mass on the hanger. Because if we add more mass on the hanger, it's going to be increasing the overall unbalanced forces on the system. And we said that was the force of gravity on mass too. So we're going to do this by adding uh, 10 to 20 gram um, increments. Of mass, we don't need a whole lot to that mass hanger, and uh, we're gonna to go ahead and add those on there. Now that little mass hanger already, um, I'm gonna draw my little picture on here. You've got a, a hanging mass um, little hook that's already on there that you add the mass to, and that itself is is already five grams. Um, so what's really important here is that if we're changing the the net force you know, by, by changing the mass on the hanger. Um, in order to have a controlled experiment, all other variables have to be constant. So what that means is that the mass of the system, I can't mess with both the net force and the mass, otherwise I'm not going to know what's affecting the acceleration. So we've got to make sure that the mass of the system is, uh, is going to be kept constant. Um, so going on back to a pure massive hanger, that was really the net force on the system, and in order to see how the net force affects the acceleration, we've got to keep the mass of the system constant. So how do we practically do this? Well, I can't just keep adding mass to my hanger because that's going to keep adding mass to the system. So all the mass that I add for my hanger is going to have to be sitting on top of my cart so that it's still in the system. Um, so I have all these little uh, you know, I've got 10, 10 grams, 20 grams. If I start with all this mass on my hanger already sitting on the back of my cart, then I can take it off from the cart and stick it onto the hanger, and it's still in the system. That's the only way we can keep the mass of the system constant. So we're going to have to take it from one part of the system to another. But now that mass that's, that was on the back of my cart, now it's, it's, it's hanging, so gravity can act on it, and there's nothing to, to kind of keep it keep it there like there was with the table on, uh, on the, underneath the cart. So now it becomes the, a part of the mass that's being pulled by the earth and is, is going to be accelerating the, the cart. Um, so for our net force on our system, it's going to be equal to the force of gravity on uh, mass 2, which is the equal to the mass of my, my hanger, my hanging mass, um, times the gravitational acceleration. So I'm going to make sure that my mass is in kilograms and we're multiplying that by 9.8 meters per second squared. Recall that to, to get to kilograms all we have to do is take the number of grams divided by a thousand to get to kilograms. And then to measure the acceleration um, all we're going to do is we've got that motion detector hooked up we're going to be able to look at our little uh, velocity time graph um, and we're going to be able to find the slope of my velocity versus time graph in order to find our acceleration. And so we're going to set up a little data table. We're going to see how changing the net force in newtons is going to be affecting the um, average acceleration in meters per second squared that we get from our graph. Um, and then in order to find our net force, you know, we're going to be taking the mass on our hanger. So let's say I do a trial with just my little 5 grams on there. I divide my 5 grams by 1,000. Uh, we're going to get to kilograms, 0 
kilograms, and I multiply that by 9.8, and I'm going to get you know some number here, 0 0.0049 um, newtons. And we're going to we're going to have our little value there, and then we're going to measure the acceleration experimentally. Then we'll add some more mass of the hanger. It's going to change the unbalanced force, the force of gravity um, that's acting on that whole system, and then we can measure the acceleration and go from there. Um, experiment two is uh, a little bit easier. Um, if I'm changing just acceleration and mass, I need to keep the other variable um, constant. So we're going to be changing the mass of the system. And that means that we need to have a constant net force. That means we have a, need to have a constant net force. So by changing the mass of the system, we're not going to add mass down here because that's going to cause a, a bigger force on the system. So we're just going to add the mass on the cart only. Okay, on the cart only so that we can go ahead and do that. Um, so to find our mass of the total, uh, the total system, we're going to add up the cart. We're going to add up all the mass on the back of the 500-gram cart. We're going to add whatever's on our hanging system to find our mass, and then we can take our mass and once again um, turn it into kilograms um, by taking you know, the number of grams divided by 1,000, and then um, I can calculate my acceleration by taking that slope of my VT graph again. Um, and so I'll have a little data table here. We'll have our mass of our system in kilograms. Um, and then we're going to be measuring that average acceleration from the graph meters per second squared, and then we can um, we can have a relationship. Now, before we get started with the lab, I'd like you to make a little prediction, and the prediction is what do you think this is going to look like graphically? Um, so maybe what you're doing is you're uh, pulling out your um, your experimental design packet, and we're figuring out uh, what you think this graph shape is going to look like. So we have a whole bunch of different type of variations that we talked about in this class. We had parabolic, we had inverse, we had square root variation, different kinds of things. We had linear. So go back and look at your experimental design packet and types of variations and pick what you think is going to happen. As the net force increases, what's going to happen? Do you predict it's going to happen to the acceleration? And then based on that prediction, what kind of relationship would that look like? Um, as the mass increases, what's going to happen to the acceleration? What would that look like? And you're going to need to look at some of those graph shapes and types of variation in order to, uh, to figure that out. Um, so kind of looking back here, um, just what do those different uh, graph shapes look like? You know, there's some different options. No relationship, linear, there's inverse. We've got parabolic, and then I've got a square root polyp parabolic. You know, using those different graph shapes, what do you think it's going to, uh, to look like? All right, so that's going to be our pre-lab section. Um, I hope that this was a uh, was helpful for you, and um, hopefully this helps prepare us for our, our, our lab.